It's the All Night Long Wrestling Podcast. With the Enforcer. I believe they're called Enforcers, Gordon. I sell women's shoes. And the Stallion. Stallion, baby! I am not what you would call a handsome man. I'll kick you in the nuts and you'll smile at me and like it. Oh, nice! we are back the all night long wrestling podcast with a video edition you know why we have video because some gentleman on one of the wrestling forums said people want to see us it'll make it more interesting he obviously negated how incredibly ugly i am so I don't think that's going to happen. But he might. Uh, he might have some ads on Craigslist that we don't know about. So we have to be, you know, <laughs> be I don't careful care, about. That. I don't care if he has ads anywhere. He's a subscriber. We're going to take it. Welcome yeah. back to the All Night Long Wrestling Podcast. He is your host, The Stallion. I am your host, The Enforcer, and we are back with a video edition of the All Night Long Wrestling Podcast. But not just any edition of the All Night Long Wrestling Podcast. The Great American Bash 1989 edition, or as some say, the greatest American Bash. Of all time. You and I were talking about this uh, about a week ago. I, I forget how this came. Oh, because you made me watch. Uh, what was that shit you made me watch? All right, Dude. first of all. Yes. All right, so you asked me. You were watching WWE Network, and you asked me for a show, a recommendation. So uh, given that you said you had about four hours, I suggested that you watch Tuesday in Texas from, uh, I think, November 19th or early December 1991. Um which is only a two-hour show, so I figured you had room to then watch something else afterwards. Uh, there was a quality. You to start me at the bottom before you work my way up. Now, see, this is where I get confused because I we talked about this the Macho Man Jake Roberts match. We don't need to get into at whole angle. I'm sure everybody's aware of all that and the, and the quality of that. And then you told me that the show. I won't repeat the words that you used, but you told me that the show was was not good. You didn't like it, but yet then afterwards when we broke it down. You said that better than ha- more than half the show was was better than average. So I was a little confused uh, by your reaction and your B rating of me uh, for suggesting that you watch Tuesday in Texas. I just feel like out of all the shows in the WWE Network, tu- Tuesday in Texas was not uh, it wasn't as enjoyable. But I feel like you rebounded because I I cut a promo on you. That's what happened. So I got a promo on you about that. You're like, you know what? Fine, fine. Just watch Great American Bash '89. And I was like, okay. And then I, I thought back to my mind. I mean, I love NWA. I love WCW. I wasn't sure which Great American Bash 89 was. And that one, to this day, is widely regarded as one of the greatest pay-per-views wrestling events of all time. True or false? That is true. Yes. I think a lot of the, uh, I don't know what you want to call them, experts, uh, critics, internet people, uh, all seem to uh, have Hunt- high praise for like Bash 89. Hunt- was it Mark's? Uh Yes. Okay. Yeah. So yeah, there's a lot of people out there that have uh, strong, positive feelings about uh, Great American Bash A9. So much so that I can tell you that back in the days of uh, tape trading, which is I was back maybe in the late '90s, early 2000s when I was uh, kind of in the market for tape trading. I actually bought a VHS of Great American Bash 1989 off of eBay. Um, and uh, sure enough, I watched it a few times on VHS, and now with the uh, the network, obviously we're you know we're talking like 15 years later. Uh, you can watch it anytime you want on uh, on all your uh, mobile players and and uh, accessories and things like that. Uh, so and now it's uh, you know, why the network is worthwhile. I completely yeah. agree with you. Man. I remember stuff like that was so hard to come by, especially at Blockbuster. And you, you said, or would you say late 90s, early 2000s? That's when I was, um, you know, kind of at that point. I was at you know I was like late high school or like early college year. So I had like some amount of money, a small amount, but it was some money. And I used it to buy like 15 and $20 VHS tapes from people um, online. So I would buy stuff like from WCW and NWA and like old WWF pay-per-views that like I didn't order when I was a kid. And there was no other way to get them if you couldn't get it from like Blockbuster or Hollywood Video or something like that. So um, Bash 89, I had ordered specifically because the reviews I had heard about it were so great, and I and I had not really seen a lot of wrestling from that era at that time, uh, so I ordered it, and sure enough, it lived up to the hype. And now it's at everyone's fingertips on the WWE Network. Thank you, Vince McMahon. So, how do you do? You want to go match by match and give our ratings for the match? How do you want to do it? Because I'm prepared for everything. 
Yeah, let's. Uh, so let's get into that. I guess. Uh, let's see here. There's a Great American Bash card, right? We'll just go with the main card now. I guess. Do you want to set the mood a little bit for Great American Bash? Are you nine? Not only do I love the Great American Bash 1989. Not only do I love WCW. Not only do I love the 80s. But you know what I love most about the 1980s, Joe? What's that, pal? The music. Oh, you want more? Hold on. Yeah, yeah, keep going. You needed the ending. If that didn't scream 1989 to you, I don't know what did. Set the mood, Joe. What's going on in 1989? Um, Gods of Roses are huge. I think Air Ghostbusters. Ghostbusters was that? Ghostbusters two? When, when was that? Was that uh, you know? Could be. Yeah, that was Ghostbusters 2. I think it's Teenage Mutant Ninja Turtles 2 right around that time. Um, as far as WWE, they had WrestleMania 5. Yes, WrestleMania 5 was at that time. Uh, Friday the 13th, uh, Jason Takes Manhattan, whichever that was. That was, I believe, 1988. was one of my all-time favorites, uh, Friday the 13th. It's like 1989 was, was awesome. Yeah, I think Debbie Gibson was a thing back then. Um, but also... Uh, for the folks that actually stick around for the rest of the show, we're going to be playing, we're going to be closing out tonight's show uh, with a hit song from the year 1989. So that will be playing. Oh my God, that's going to be so awesome. Yeah, post the the uh, the review here of, of the Great American Bash. So, is, uh, it, is it Don Johnson Heartbeat? No, it's not. But now I feel like I let everybody down because it's not Don Johnson Heartbeat 1989. So maybe that's. Heartbeating. I love Don Johnson. All right, so let's get into it. 1989 was an awesome time in. Uh, WCW, NWA, there was a lot going on. Um, it was The Horseman had split up, obviously. Ric Flair was solo at this point. Um, you had a lot of – there were a lot of guys that came from uh, – well, not necessarily. I mean, Terry Funk was a guy that had showed up. When was he – maybe, what, six months before that? Eight months before that? Not even. Yeah, I don't remember exactly when he jumped over. I know the whole angle was kicked off, and I'm sure we'll get into more of the details later. Was you know the the Flair Steamboat series took place in '89. Uh, Flair ended up, and at the end of that series, Flair had the title. Uh, Terry Funk, I believe, was a judge for that last match. If it had it gone to a draw, they would have had the judges vote. And uh, Funk was a judge at that point, and he baby interviewed face. Flair. He was a babyface. Babyface, yes. He interviewed Flair post match and challenged him to a title match and then uh, flair kind of told him you know you gotta you gotta wait in line terry right he wasn't a full-time wrestler anymore at that time hey, johnny hollywood he had just started in roadhouse <laughs> that's a shoot he was really in roadhouse i know I just any roadhouse reference i think that you can get out there is really um you know, roadhouse. Again. but uh yeah so he uh and then, then funk uh did not like that answer, of course, and then turned on him and did the whole the, the angle with the pile drivers and, and Flair's neck and, and a lot of stuff, which was uh, still cool stuff for me to watch even, even to this day. So, um, Huge pop for me. I, it was – the thing about – before we get into each match by match, I want to let everybody know. The thing about the Great American Bash 89, the wrestling was great. But what's even as good as the wrestling was the stories leading up to each one of the big matches on this card. I mean – Back then, who was booking? Was was Dusty booking at this point, or was he? You know, it's it's funny you say that because I was thinking about that when I was watching the show, and I never um, looked that up to see if it was who actually was booking. Whether it was, uh, I don't think it was Dusty because Dusty was at um, he was in the WWF in late 1989. I remember he was at Survivor Series and SummerSlam '89. So I'm thinking he was. I mean, based on that, I'm saying he wasn't the booker here. I don't know if it was Flair. Um, it might have been Flair himself. Um, I'm not sure. We should probably look that up. What's that? Uh, Ole Anderson too. He was, yeah, he was there. So I don't know. Um, I do oh, remember Ole. We got a call. Him. Call who? Ole? Wh- whoever was booking. Okay. Because we need that today. So can you write that down? Are you making a list? I'm writing it down as we speak, my friend. All right, cool. All right. So let's kick off Great American Bash 1989. I'm not uh, that big of a fan of Battle Royals. I, I know they're uh, – I mean, they, they're boring. They're kind of monotonous. It's the same thing over and over. I actually enjoyed this. Um, this was a 
$50,000 Triple Crown Two Ring King of the Hill Battle. King of the Ring Battle Royal? Or the, uh, King of the Hill Battle Royal. There were two rings, and there was a lot of. There was a lot of big names in this battle world, though. But it came down to uh, skyscrapers. Dan Spivey and Sid Justice or Vicious. What was he at this point? Sid Vicious. Sid Vicious, managed by Teddy Long. One guy won each ring, and they decided they are not going to fight each other. I thought it was um, obviously for the other guys in the battle royal, you know, not great. But it kind of built up the skyscrapers as a formidable tag team, who you know the WCW uh, NWA would focus on for a couple months to come after that. Yeah, and I think um, this is the first period of time that I remember Sid being significantly popular or over with the fans, right? So when I knew who Sid was when the first time I watched Bash 89 just because I'd seen him uh, as Sid Justice and Psycho Sid and then his time at WCW later on. But I guess at this point, he was more of a younger, um, you know, up-and-coming guy that, that the fans were really into. And uh, that's the one thing I took away from this battle royal was how over Sid was and how over the powerbomb move itself was. Oh, people were really top for it. Yeah. yeah. So um, really quickly before we move on to match number two, uh, I looked up the head bookers, the history of bookers for WCW. And um, this is why they call you the stallion. In 1989, it started with George Scott and then shifted into a booking committee of uh, Ric Flair, Jim Cornette, Jim Ross, Kevin Sullivan, and Eddie Gilbert. Um, and oh, that lasted into 1990. So I think I'm going to go with those. That was the booking committee for this show since it was so good. Um, I don't know George Scott from A Hole in the Wall, so I'm going to assume he had nothing to do with this. George C. Scott. Wasn't he in Angus? Wasn't he Sir George C. Scott? Um, that might be it. We might have to take that one offline. Uh, I figured that out, <laughs> but, but, uh, yeah, so I think it was, the, I'm going to go with the booking committee. Cause the booking committee here lasted from 89 to 1990. Ole Anderson took over at some point in 90. And then Dusty Rhodes, when he came back, uh, was from 1991 to 1994, um, with help from Ole Anderson and Jim Ross. So I think that booking committee was the one that was doing this show in particular. Okay. Sorry um, for the, uh, third history lesson there, but that's, I just wanted to. No, no, I much. definitely appreciate the um, appreciate the history lesson. Now we know at least going forward. Next match was a very young flying Brian Pillman against Wild Bill Irwin, who I believe was a was he the goon? He was the goon. Yes, it's true. Goon himself, a young flying Brian Pillman. I mean, uh, Jim Ross is all over him about his time in the Cincinnati Bengals. I thought it was a good match for what it was. It went longer than I thought. I went about uh, ten minutes or so, but I will say. Um, I saw Brian Pillman hit a sling blade in this match. He did, so, yeah. Um, Pillman was, uh, I guess, at this point, right? This is pre, pre injury, pre accident. Uh, Brian Pillman. He uh, he did a lot of cool stuff in here. I guess the I guess the match was really just a showcase for him uh, to get him over. And I think the finish from off the top, if I can remember, was they had the, they had the two rings set up like he talked about and he dove from the turnbuckle of the second ring into the first ring with a cross body right and pill and pinned uh, Irwin to win yeah and they did it in slow mo and Irwin took that in the face hard but that was uh that was a good match i think you know like guys like um you know the z man flying brian pillman what's with what did i do something wrong nope keep going buddy you're all good was it the in the face comment uh he took it in the face hard i believe was your exact comment so I didn't want to go back to that, but since you picked up on my my, uh, now we're doing the video. People wanted video for this particular reason. Uh, yeah. So after he took it in the face, uh, you know, WCW was doing a lot to push. Even at this point, the younger, faster wrestlers, which WWF at this point wasn't focusing on. So Brian Pillman, um, the Z Man, even the Steiners, a little bit. Um, these guys were, you know, they were coming up the upper mid card, and it, it was a different, it was different than anything you saw on WWF. So them pushing, um, you know, I, I like them pushing Brian Pillman, and uh, he, the crowd loved them. And there were a lot of very young, pretty ladies with mullets that were swooning over him. So they were doing something right. Let's see what we got after that. <laughs> oh, the next. Speaking of the skyscrapers, uh, they had a pretty rough match with the dynamic dudes. Um, there is a great part where Shane, uh, dynamic dudes. 